Hello, and welcome to the Scriptures Are Real podcast. This is the podcast where we talk about times where the Scriptures became real to us because we believe that there's great power in the Scriptures and it becomes even more powerful and applicable to us when we feel how real they are in our lives. I'm your host, Kerry Mulstein, and I'm so excited to have with me today my good friend and colleague, Keith Wilson. Uh, who I've taught with here at BYU for a, a long time. I don't want to say like really long time because it makes us both sound old, but uh, for a long time. So welcome, Keith. Good to have you with us. Uh, the truth of the matter, Kerry, is we are old. Uh, well, no, no, strike that from the record. But no, all right. Uh, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so, Keith, would you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, I'd love to. Uh, I've uh, I've been teaching here in ancient scripture now for some four decades. Uh, oh, you um, are three- old. Three, three of which were full-time, one was part-time, uh, and I hail from Southern California, but the lousy part, uh, down by Barstow on the desert. My dad was <laughs> a, uh, um, uh, an engineer for the Navy, uh, but it was a weapons testing station down there and he, so that they could set off bombs in the desert and nobody <laughs> get uptight. So that I was... Think uh, we've, I don't think we've ever talked about that, but that was in my <laughs> mission, actually. But, uh, was it really? Yeah, yeah we, were out, we were out in a place called Ridgecrest or China Lake. Oh, just yeah. To, just I've been to, in Ridgecrest. Just, yeah. I, I think if you got sent there, you'd probably done something wrong with your mission president. <laughs> <or something. laughs> no, actually, we had a counselor in the mission presidency that lived in Ridgecrest. So I, I, <laughs> I went out and did some stuff with him a couple of times. But. Yeah, so that was where I was raised out in the desert. I uh, came up to BYU uh, and uh, really found myself here uh, and my sort of a niche. Uh, and my brother and I, uh, going through our undergrad after we after I served a mission in Austria, uh, we started a diamond business and it kind of took off. But all along, I knew that I wanted to teach. And so I, I just tried to get as much education as I could. I did a master's here in addition to an undergrad. Uh, and then I uh, transferred, started a PhD and transferred up to the U uh, and studied with a professor up there that was really good. And I did higher education and kind of the change uh, in higher education, uh, especially change from religious roots to uh, to secular roots. And so that's always been an interest of mine. And now I research and write on the RLDS and uh, the uh, the path that they've taken in the last 50 years, kind of diverging really from the restoration and going back to more of a traditional uh, Protestant Christian church. So that's kind of been my, my research focus. Uh, and scripturally, I've just spread across the scriptures, Book of Mormon, New Testament, Old Testament, uh, and, and I just love the scriptures. So I'm really pleased to be on your uh, podcast this morning and talk about the scriptures. And, and I'll just say, I don't think we have anyone here uh, in our college that is more passionate about teaching the scriptures and about uh, t- making sure that we teach the scriptures well than Keith. He's a uh, great uh, for always keeping us on point on that, and and uh, I've appreciated that. So thank you, Keith. Oh, thanks, Kerry. So I know that there are lots of things. I think it's also worth pointing out that uh, Keith is a patriarch in his stake, uh, uh, which I know is a responsibility that weighs heavily on you and, and uh, you take seriously. And we're grateful for uh, patriarchs. I think anyone who's received a patriarchal blessing is grateful for patriarchs. But um yeah, in any case, uh, I, I might say, Kerry, it's the it's the scariest calling I've had in the church, and I've had I've had a, a most of them, you know, leadership callings, bishop and branch president, and uh, and the the scariest calling, you know, Cub Scouts and nursery and, yeah. <laughs> uh, and gospel doctrine teacher. But this one, uh, being a patriarch, uh, kind of ties me in a little bit with our Old Testament discussions. But it it is uh, it is terrifying. It just is. I. I, I will breathe a sigh of relief when they finally put me on non-functioning status because you just uh, uh, you, you you just have to you just have to be comfortable with receiving revelation and you know revelation is is just an interesting thing when you when you get right down to the basics of what what is a revelatory thought an, an impression or an image and so it's it's been a it's been a fast tutorial uh, still. Uh, every Sunday when I have a blessing, I just, uh, it's just such a humbling thing. I, anyway, I don't think I'll ever get used to it, but, uh, yeah, but after you give a hundred or so, then sort of, you, you try to be more comfortable anyway. Yeah. Let's dive um, in. We're, we're grateful. We're grateful for patriarchs really. And I, I, I know it's a, it's a weight to, 
take that seriously to receive revelation for someone else. Uh, so we, we appreciate yeah. you. Well, yeah, let's jump in and just ask about a time when the scriptures became very real for you. I know you could share lots and lots and lots of times, but we'll, we'll just uh, start with one time and maybe we'll do another another time. Sure. Uh, and uh, and I want to kind of uh, dovetail two uh, scriptures together here, but uh, a time that really jumps out at me uh, as we talk about a meaningful uh, scriptural experience. I, I just barely arrived in the mission field in Austria. Uh, and I was in, I'd been there probably for about two to three weeks. And I was sent out to a small little area. It was the middle of uh, the beginning of winter, late November, early December. Uh, and I had a, I had a great companion, uh, but uh, we just didn't have really much of a, the, the field was not very wide other than the fact that it was snowing outside. It was, uh, there were 3,000 members in total in Austria uh, and in our little area, our whole area. We had one widow, okay, that was, uh, that was a semi-active member of the church, one widow in our entire area. Uh, and I remember as I started, uh, all we did was tracked because we didn't have any other contacts and things. As I started in, the language was hard. The weather was cold. I was from the desert. I'd never, you know, we'd seen two overcast days all year. And all of a sudden, for a month, I didn't even see the sun. It was just always overcast and gray. And my spirits fell quickly. And I can remember uh, praying hard and going to the scriptures and just trying to work through those initial days uh, and, uh, and, and just looking for anything that would encourage me. And I was reading in my in my reading program, I was just starting in again with the Book of Mormon, and I was reading in First Nephi 14, and I can remember, I just barely received a letter from from home, and I'd gone into the other room to read it because I didn't want my companion to see me crying. I was so homesick. <laughs> it was just a real tough time for a young, you know, 19-year-old boy, yeah. and, uh, and I was reading in First Nephi 14 where it's talking about uh, the Lord, and he categorizes all religion and faith in, in two churches, the church of the devil and the church of the, of the Lamb of God. And as I was just reading there in 14 about the church of the Lamb of God, I was cruising along and, and, and not going too deep. And then I came ar- across verse, uh, let's see, I'll just go right to the verse. I came across verse 12. And it said, and it came to pass that I beheld the church of the Lamb of God, and its numbers were few because of the wickedness and abominations of the whore who sat upon the many waters. Nevertheless, I beheld that the church of the Lamb of God, uh, who were the saints upon the uh, um, who were the saints of God, were also upon all the face of the earth. And uh, and then it goes on and talks about them being scattered. Uh, and I, and as I read that, I. You know, I baptized my best friend in high school, and and I wanted to taste of that, and yet all I was doing was just getting doors slammed in my face and not right. understanding people. And then I read that passage, and it said its numbers were few, and I just thought, we don't we don't have to be the majority faith in order to be doing God's work and to be part of God's plan. And I that day, I just kind of girded up my loins and said, come on, buck up, uh, Elder Wilson. Uh, you might not be in the majority. Everybody might not say great things, but but you're doing the Lord's work. And, uh, and so that was a real turning point early on for me where I just thought, no, I don't have to be uh, baptized huge numbers, and I don't have to be part of the majority faith uh, in order to know that I'm doing God's work. And so I, I loved uh, that one. It uh, it propelled me forward. Later on in the book of First Nephi, as I was reading there in chapter uh, seventeen, it uh, it it discussed the Old Testament example of the brazen serpent, and I remember reading that and just thinking about it, and and it talked about it being uh, fiery flying serpents. Uh, And I went back and looked at the Old Testament account uh, where it had been uh, discussing fiery serpents. The Book of Mormon adds kind of flying that dimension to it. Uh, And ever since then, I've just kind of been 
Uh, I've loved it. One of the first articles I wrote as a new faculty was about the Book of Mormon's use of the uh, Old Testament numbers example of the fiery flying serpents. So maybe we could go ahead and kind of jump in on that. Uh, uh, what's uh, uh, It's in Numbers 21. It's where the original account is. What I found, Gary, that's really fascinating is the Book of Mormon is more focused in commentary on the brazen serpent and the and the and the fiery serpents that strike the people of the the Israelites, it, the Book of Mormon has five references to it. Whereas the the Old Testament, in in the original text, your it comes forth in the Book of Numbers. There's one other mention of brazen serpents, and that's uh, Hezekiah. Uh, breaking the and smashing the brazen serpent that, quote, Moses had made. Uh, and so that's the only reference. And that's always kind of fascinated me that the Book of Mormon prophets caught a hold of this even more than our Old Testament text delivered to us uh, in our scriptures. Uh, uh, yeah. Any comments yeah. on that? Well, yeah, and I think uh, let's just make sure we highlight for our readers that Hezekiah does that because at that point it had become idolatrous, not because he didn't like Moses, but uh, because it had become an object of worship, which is not what it was designed to be. But I I think it isn't. Now, Kerry, wasn't it it even with the groves that it was kind of uh, sort of part of that idol worship? Yeah, Yeah, they they, uh, had it with some other... uh, things that were associated with the temple, but had been turned into idolatrous uh, practices. So, um, and I think you're right. And and I, I mean, we don't know for sure. I'm just uh, reading between 20 lines, but I think that the reason it becomes big in the Book of Mormon is because of Nephi, because of that reference you're talking about in First Nephi 17. Nephi shaped so much of the symbolism between uh, the vision that he and Lehi had and uh, the things that he taught early in his ministry, or I guess early in Book of Mormon ministry, as the kind of lead and first prophet uh, of the Nephite nation. Of course, Lehi is in a way for all of uh, the Lehi's children, but specifically for Nephites, it's Nephi. And they looked to him a lot for their direction. And he, he picked up on this as a symbol that he used. And I think all of his successors were influenced by that. Uh, yeah, isn't that isn't that the truth? And when you think about it chronologically, uh, this is eighth century, uh, 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 bef- uh, you know, uh, Old Testament times, eighth century, and so it's only a couple hundred years uh, from the time that Nephi and Lehi leave Jerusalem. So they're really connected with those scriptures and things. So when I say eight hundred years, that's when Hezekiah uh, destroys the brazen serpent that the scriptures say Moses had made. Uh, it's yeah. probably a, probably an image of something that Moses had made, but, uh, yeah, but it's nonetheless, just a couple of generations after Hezekiah that that Lehi leaves. Uh, right. So, so so it seems like they're really connected with this, and I love the way you said uh, Nephi seems to bring it in, and other book of, Nephi mentions it twice, but then Alma's on it twice, and then Helaman is on it also, and so it's like. Uh, Nephi preserves this for that branch of Israel, uh, and they really uh, keep it in mind and refer to it frequently. Yeah, agreed. Well, with your Old Testament background, let's uh, let's take them back through Numbers uh, chapter twenty-one, where the where the account is. Uh, so, um, I'll, uh, why don't I just uh, jump in and give kind of a thumbnail sketch, and then you add details, uh, Carrie, as you uh, have been over there and everything. Uh, uh, but uh, so uh, the Israelites then are <clears throat> are in the wilderness and these uh, 40 years of kind of wandering, they're getting back closer to the promised land and going back into the promised land. Uh, and they hit up against the Canaanites there in southern uh, Palestine, uh, Bershe- uh, uh, Beersheba. Is that the way you pronounce it now? I've yeah, always pronounced Beersheba. It. Yeah. Beersheba. Beersheba. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> And so they have a big battle there, uh, and uh, the uh, Canaanites uh, hold, and they uh, kind of, well, let's see. So Israel, let's see, where are we talking? Uh, oh, it's Arad, or yeah. Arad, uh, yeah. in verse 1 of 21, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and he comes out and fights against them, uh, and Israel bows this vow in verse 2, and the Lord hearkens to Israel and delivers the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them at a place called Hormoth. So I, I think that on the map, uh, the Hormoth isn't, uh, or Hormoth, isn't that uh, just kind of 
a uh, little bit east and south of uh, Beersheba. Yeah, it's it's in that if it's the same place we're thinking of, uh, you know, and you never sometimes you can be a little off when you think you've pinpointed an ancient uh, site, but it's yeah very very south and east uh, uh, of modern day Israel, which would make sense because the next verse talks in verse four it talks about them going by way of the Red Sea, and that's down in southeastern Israel uh, to compass the land of Edom. Uh, so they're not, they can't go through Edom. They're going to have to go around it because the Edomites don't want them to go through. And God says, you can't fight them. They're your relatives. So uh, that's modern day Petra area. And so it would make sense that uh, you just go, they're down in that southeastern corner and they have to go around the Red Sea and then way out east to go around uh, this really deserted area uh, that is uh, modern day Petra. Okay, I'm going to try something. It'll probably be an abysmal failure. Uh, But here's one of our uh, Bible study maps in our scriptures. Yeah, and and for our listening audience, some will not have video. So can you tell them just what uh, map number or name that is? So So it's map number three, uh, the Exodus, and our King James uh, maps at the back. And as I hold that up, you'll kind of see there the the red kind of oblong circle there. So that's pretty much tracing the path of the Israelites. And you can see over on the left-hand side, you have kind of some uh, double arrows or double path there. And that's where the battle occurs right up there, um, uh, where the Canaanites are defeated. But then they can't cross through Edom, uh, as Kerry said. So they have to kind of circle that. So they're really, it's it must have been a miserable uh, kind of uh, traversing around that in order yeah. to get into uh, what we call now, you know, Southern Jordan and things. Uh, and so that's where it occurs that they, that they're really disgusted. And it says that light, the Lord is giving them light bread. They loathe this light bread is the translation in your King James. Kerry, do you want to tell us, is this kind of a derivative of manna still? I, I'm guessing this- it's manna because we know they had, were given manna before this and they have manna throughout. So I'm guessing it's this manna that they're sick of. And and it is tough territory. I mean, this this makes uh, Ridgecrest look pretty lush. Um, <laughs> so it's, 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 uh, so just to give you an idea, uh, the uh, Petra area, they would have had to go south and east of there, and you get around an area called Wadi Rum, which is where they filmed the the movie. I can't remember exactly what it's called, but it's something like Martian or uh, anyway. That they when they wanted to film uh, uh, an area that they thought would look like Mars because there's no real life there, they went and filmed it in this area. Uh, that, <laughs> so that you really can't see uh, uh, just the lifelessness of the area. It's it's a dry, arid area. Well, and so uh, that's that's where they bog down. That's where they mentally bog down. Uh, Moses is not going to be allowed into the promised land now uh, because of what uh, happened there at Meribah and the waters of Meribah. And so uh, we have then this situation where uh, as they journey there and they have to go around Edom and they're stuck out in the desert. Uh, it says in verse four, and the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. Uh, and the people spake against Mo- God and against Moses. So that's verse five. Uh, why have you brought us out of Egypt? There's there's no bread here. There's no water. Uh, our soul loatheth. And it's just, oh, you can you can begin to imagine how uh, discouraged they are. This this is hot, indisp- uh, you know, it's just uh, the wind blo- blows and dries you out. It's just day yeah. in, day out, the same thing. In fact, maybe I can share a little story about that, if that's all right. Sure. I remember one time, the first time I took my family to uh, live in Jerusalem for a year, the first thing we did before we even got to Jerusalem is we wanted I wanted to take them down to Egypt. Of course, it's me, right? I had to go to Egypt. Uh, and then we were going to go over to see Petra. And so we went down and we were just hauling our own luggage ourselves, walking across these borders. And it was 110 degrees. And there was that hot, uh, hot wind blowing that you're talking about. And we're just standing in these lines outside. Uh, and it is just miserable. And I've got uh, six kids between the age of 12 and, and two, no, thir- uh, 13 and three. And, uh, and it's just miserable. And as, as we were doing that, I thought, you know, I, I have Israelite ancestors that were in this exact area with kids, probably families this similar to mine. And uh, I know at least that in a little while, I'm going to get into an air-conditioned car, uh, maybe half an hour, an hour, but I, I'm going to get out of this. They were never 
going to get out of this ever. And it struck me that uh, the miracle would have been if they didn't murmur. Like I, I, before this, I'd always thought, oh, those Israelites, they were murmuring what was wrong with them. And at this point, I thought, if I were here taking care of my family in these kind of situa- this kind of condition, I think I'd be murmuring. Uh, I can't point my finger at them anymore. I, I really think I would have ended up murmuring. So and, uh, uh, and, it's, it's yeah. tough. In the Book of Mormon, when uh, Nephi takes kind of a pause and talks about their journey, and they're out in this same area, yeah. uh, he, he says, Laman and Lemuel were just coming unglued. And one of the things in chapter 17 of 1 Nephi, verse 2, uh, Laman and Lemuel are teeing off and they said, no, I'm sorry, it's verse 20. They, they, they make the statement, our women have had to bear children in the wilderness uh, and eat on raw meat uh, and, and suffer all kinds of uh, deprivations. Yeah. It would have been better for them if they'd never been born. And that's what they say. If they'd never been born, you know, yeah. that was how 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 tough it was uh, just for Nephi's group in this same area. And it okay. is hard when your family is suffering. It's uh, for me at least. I, I, it's harder than if it's just you. But when you're when you feel like you're making your family suffer because you told them to come on this, uh, yeah. that's tough. Anyway, yeah, sorry. Yeah, keep so, going. So true. All right. So. Uh, so verse 5 of Numbers chapter 21, uh, the people speak against Moses and, and complain uh, uh, and all manner of things, the food, the no water, just lousy, lousy conditions. Uh, and in verse 6, it says, the Lord sent fiery flying serp- or fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and much of the people of Israel died. Okay, uh, and when uh, when they see their plight, they come back to Moses and say, yeah, we've sinned. We shouldn't have complained and spoken against the Lord. Uh, that's in verse seven. Uh, and, uh, and, and now, please, we're, we're, we're humbled. Uh, pray the Lord that he take away the serpents from us. And Moses prayed for the people, it says. Verse eight, and the Lord said to Moses, make thee a fiery serpent and set it upon, set it upon a pole. And it shall come to pass that everyone that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of the brass and put it upon a pole. And it came to pass that if the ser- if a, a serpent had bitten any man, when he he- when he beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. And then it just and then it just leaves the example and goes forward. Okay, but it leaves us with this really uh, very singular kind of situation where uh, they're being bitten. They com- uh, they they're humbled. Uh, uh, and it must have, it's obviously, uh, when it says fiery serpents, it must have been referring to the fact that they were poisonous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be that and, fiery bite, right? And, uh, and man, I can tell you in the Book of Mormon, chapter 17, it says fiery flying serpents, where I was raised out there in Ridge, Ridgecrest, in some areas where there were bigger washes, they'd have a lot of sagebrush and it would get quite thick, kind of creosol and sage and things. Uh, and uh, you couldn't really see the ground too well when you walked through those bushy areas in these ravines and things. And But we used to love to go down in there because that's where all the lizards were. And the, and the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, some of the, the, you know, the, the harmless snakes. But every once in a while when you'd be down in there, you'd disturb a rattlesnake, uh, uh, good old timber, uh, uh, you know, uh, diamondback rattlesnake. And you couldn't even see the snake, but when you disturbed it and you got too close to it, that rattle would go off (laughs) and it just put the fear of death in you. And you didn't know where the snake was, but you did know that, that a big enough rattlesnake can, can cover three and four feet, you know, when it strikes and you just you just kind of would would very gently just start to back up and try to get out of that immediate area uh and i can imagine that this was a horrifying experience because people were dying so their legs are swelling up from the snake bites and things like that yeah uh, that fiery yeah. adjective makes you feel like it must have been painful really really painful yeah, exactly yeah. Uh, and uh uh, and and snake bites don't kill you immediately. They right. start to swell, and then it goes into constriction and everything else. It takes a couple days, uh, and oh, this would have been just uh, horrifying for the people. So that's what humbles them. They go back then, and Moses makes this uh, kind of a weird image: uh, a serpent on a pole. And and for us, serpents usually are seen just just totally in the negative. 
very few people like to have uh, a pet rattlesnake or anything like that. You know, <laughs> yeah. it's uh, uh, we go to all other kinds of pets and animals, but 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 not a slimy snake that's poisonous or anything like that. So why did why did God instruct Moses to use a serpent? OK, uh, do you want to launch in on that one, Carrie, or do you want me to kind of uh, I'd love to hear what you have to say first. So. Uh, the, the fascinating thing anciently is that uh, our study of ancient cultures tells us that the serpent was a dual image. Mm -hmm. Now, that's changed in our modern time. And so we just cannot relate with this putting a snake on a pole. Uh, and most believe that the very, what do they call it, a catechus or something, uh, the, the serpent on the pole for the medical symbol, mm -hmm. uh, most believe that that's probably a derivative of this ancient uh, example of uh, Moses putting a serpent on the pole as a sign of a healing uh, kind of power. Right. Uh, but nevertheless, this, uh, this serpent image is a, is a weird one for us until you realize that anciently, the serpent was seen as both a sign of life and of death. Yeah. It was an image that was used, a dual image. Uh, for us, it's become a single image, but back then it was a dual image. So let's explore that just a little so you understand. Very first one, in the Garden of Eden, uh, Eve is tempted and Satan comes as what? As a snake. And Eve doesn't, like most women would do, Eve doesn't recoil and say, ooh, a snake, get me out of here. You know, and I shouldn't say women, men too. You know, who loves a, yeah. who loves a slimy old snake that's going to bite you? Uh, that's not Eve's response. Eve dialogues with the snake and everything else. Why? Because the snake was also a symbol of, of, uh, of birth uh, and of eternity. Uh, in your, you could tell us more, Carrie, in your Egyptian uh, symbolism, uh, but there's, uh, who is it? Atum is actually, there's a document where he is discussing the afterlife or something like that with Osiris. Uh, and, and he says, I'm going to go back into the form of a snake, yeah. uh, something like that, a document like that, uh, uh, yeah. meaning the eternities and things. Uh, do you want to jump in? Sure. I mean, uh, and, and you're right, but I think both snakes and water are, they're the two things that universally in the ancient world, and I'm, I mean, like in the Americas and ancient, uh, you know, uh, like the Iraq area, wherever, they have both life-giving and death-bringing qualities, right? And, and you can see with water, yeah, you, if you don't have it, you're going to die. If you get too much of it, you die, right? Um, <laughs> floods are a problem as well. Uh, and the same thing with snakes. Part of the reason that snakes are uh, have this symbolism of rebirth and thus of eternity is because of the way they shed their skin, right? And since they shed their skin, you can see the old snake left behind and the new snake that's going off. And, and that becomes a symbol of rebirth and uh, renewal of life. Uh, and uh, anthropologically, I'll often also talk about where well, you take that that symbol of something that can harm you, and if you can harness it, then it can be something that saves you. And, and they were aware also that you could build up uh, immunity to snake bites and things like that. Um, so uh, you get this kind of idea of trying to harness both that rebirth symbolism and trying to harness the, the bad and turn it into good so that it becomes uh, a, a uh, as you said, a dual symbol. So snakes uh, can save you and they can kill you. Well, that, that's fascinating to see, to talk about that uh, shedding the skin and things like that. Uh, but uh, after, after reading these accounts of where it had this dual symbolism, it made a lot more sense to me that, uh, that that's why the Lord would bring it. Now, the ultimate example of this in the, in the Old Testament account, it says they have to look, but in both the New Testament and the Book of Mormon, it makes very clear that they're looking at the image of Christ, a, yeah. symbol, a symbolic image of Christ. Uh, why don't we just look at the New Testament reference for a half second? That's John 3, uh, verse 15. John three sixteen is our famous, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But just prior to that, in verse 14, it says, as, so this is John 3, verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Uh, so, and then we get, is, for God so loved the world that he gave his only exactly. begotten Son, right? Uh, so this is clearly a Christ symbol uh, mm -hmm. uh, image in the Old Testament. It's a tough one for us because, uh, you know, who wants to, to idolize a snake, you know, but it's, but it's uh, the Lord's way of just uh, 
prefacing uh, the Savior being raised up on a pole uh, and his saving powers through the atonement. I, I just love it for that reason. Okay? Yeah. Uh, well, uh, let's let's look at one other thing in there. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the account, it says that they pray that he'd take the serpents away from them. And the Lord's generous, and he takes them away because the, his prophet Moses came and asked him to take him away, right? Mm -hmm. No. Uh, this, is, this is something that's always struck me as being really uh, significant. He doesn't take the serpents away, but he provides a remedy for them to deal with the hardship of the serpents. Yeah. And, and this is so lifelike that in life, uh, we, we hit crises, we hit things that are just insurmountable. Uh, and often we, 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 we desire for that, for that miracle to just sweep it out of our lives and, 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 and put us back upright. And instead, uh, the purpose of life is not to take away difficult things. The purpose of life is to provide a remedy to be able to make sense and to go forward in spite of difficulties. Uh, and so I think this one is just really instructive uh, that that God is not a genie in a bottle. OK, <laughs> yeah. uh, but he is providing his son who came and, and, and experienced all this negativity and still rose above that and provide provided a salvific offering for us. And so uh, this this one, I can see why the new, the Book of Mormon prophets just latched onto this, because this is so inclusive of the gospel of Jesus Christ and life and everything else. Uh, it, it just, yeah, it's uh, it's hard to, to overstate what a powerful example this is. I call it in my classes, I call it the quintessential example of focusing on the Lord, the, oh, kind of the the, the the real focal point and I, and I love how you focus or highlighted that um, it, the snakes aren't taken away and probably not immediately that the the pain is taken away I mean it may be when they see it but uh, it, it's it might take them a little bit to get this maybe I can share a story that uh, I'm ashamed it took me this long to to make the story this real for me <laughs> I, I just realized that this last summer but um, uh, this last summer, we took our youth for a youth conference down to Blanding, down to a uh, hole in the rock area. Uh, and oh, we were doing cool. pioneer stuff. You know, it was uh, come follow me church history stuff. But, you know, I'm me. And I thought, well, this is kind of uh, similar to the terrain of Edom. So we're going to we're going to do some Bible stuff as well. So uh, one morning, by the time the youth woke up, I'd, I'd brought with me a bunch of rubber snakes and I'd painted one gold and I had it hanging on a, a stick uh, over where we were having our breakfast and stuff. But I'd gotten a whole bunch of rubber snakes and I made sure they were like uh, bright colored so they wouldn't mistake them for real snakes. But, you know, they were green and red and stuff. Uh, but I'd spread them out on the path they had to take from their tents to where we were uh, eating uh, just to kind of reenact <laughs> this story. Right. But as I did that, I finally uh, I, I, I finally made me stop and think, you know, the, the camp of Israel was huge. Now, the numbers in the Bible are probably ex exaggerated, probably not quite that big. But this is a big, big group which means that some of those people, no one, well, hardly anyone is going to be right by the center of camp where the brazen serpent is. And some of them are probably like half an hour, an hour walk away, uh, where it just, yeah, if you have to start to set 10 after 10 after 10 after 10, right? And uh, and I started to think about that as some of my uh, youth were probably about a 10 minute walk away, well, a five minute walk away from uh, where the, the the pavilion was where they could put their tents as opposed to the pavilion where that kind of central area was. Right. And I thought about them encountering the snake and having to walk over to where I was. And I thought, you know, some of these Israelites, if they got bitten and, you know, Nephi says uh, they just refused to look. And I always had in my mind, well, it's right there in front of them and they just won't look up. They're just like, I'm going to look down. There's no way I'm going to look up. And I suddenly realized, well, part of the refusing to look is that they probably had to walk a ways. And if you've been bitten by a snake, actually, the last thing you feel like doing is walking on that leg that was just bitten by a snake. And so this uh, opportunity to be healed did mean they were going to have to have some pain for at least a little while. And they were going to have to put some painful effort out to get there. Uh, and I, I guess that's what they probably weren't willing to do. Uh, they'd rather just lay down and die, literally, than go through the painful effort to get to where the snake uh, was that they could look at and be saved. And I, I still think that's they must not have believed it could really save them. 
uh, the, but uh, even if you weren't sure if it's right in front of you, you'd at least look, maybe it'll save me and you look right. But if it requires a little bit of effort and you're not sure, then you probably don't put forth the effort. And that uh, seems much more like my life, right? The, the answer to our healing and the answer to God helping us is probably not just, oh, here I am, I've been bitten and all I have to do is incline my head 20 degrees and I'll be saved. Uh, I might have to walk a little ways on a painful leg. Uh, and, and I might have to have that pain for a little while and put forth some effort before the deliverance comes. That, I think that's what life is like for us. And if we want to draw a lesson from that, we have to uh, understand, I think, that, that God, like you said, he's not taking the snakes away. We're still going to get bitten. Uh, we still are few in number. If we go back to your First Nephi 14 reference, we're still few in number. Uh, we're still surrounded by wickedness and people who are going to mock us and try and do bad things to us and dig pits for us. We're still going to have this tough stuff. And when we get bitten, we're probably going to have to walk on a painful leg for a while. But deliverance is there. And if we will persevere and get to where we are steadfastly looking to Christ, then sooner or later that deliverance comes, not without pain, not without effort, but there is deliverance available. That's at least that, that was kind of the epiphany I had as I was with my youth uh, in, in Blanding, spreading rubber snakes around. So <laughs> You're a good vision, Gary. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, some things you've mentioned there just bring a, a host of other thoughts to my mind. Here's one. Uh, most people that have been around snakes know that you've got to uh, – You've got you've got to slow down the circulation. You do not yeah. want that venom to to get circulating. So it would have been counterintuitive yep. to walk back to the pole. Yeah. Uh, uh, and and like you said, it would have also been quite painful. Uh, and uh, and nowadays, the first thing you want to do with a snake bike is stop the circulation. Yeah, get you ice, lay down get and get someone else on. to take care, yeah. get you where uh, you need uh -huh. to go. And and so wow, that's uh, that's really uh, a fun insight there to think about what these people would have been going through and how much they had to trust in the prophet there, and this and this kind of crazy symbol that he'd put on a pole. Yeah. Uh, uh, how 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 counterintuitive it would have been, and I think about sometimes how. Uh, the words of the prophets aren't always the popular opinion. Uh, they sometimes seem outdated. They sometimes seem, you know, just uh, uh, sort of in a different a different world or mindset. Uh, and yet um, the Lord's prophet is still uh, that person that God's trying to influence us through uh, in, in following the path and things. Uh, that, that's really a fun thing that you said uh, with your rubber snakes. I, <laughs> I want to be in your ward. Uh, 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 all right. Well, well, what you, what you just said also reminds me, I, I think it's worth highlighting just a little bit more this idea that in the Old Testament, most of the time, the solutions God gave them didn't make sense. It's not what would make sense the way we usually think of, whether that be you know, we'll run out by the Red Sea and get trapped there and I'll take care of you there, or whether it be walk and look at a snake or whether it be walk around the walls of a city and it'll make it fall. Uh, you, I mean, like, oh, yeah, that's a great idea. Of course, that'll make it fall. Right. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Or how about you get down to 300 guys and you blow horns and, and break lamps and he'd be like, what? What a stupid idea. How is that going to win a war, right? <laughs> None of the, or, or uh, Hezekiah, or well, actually Ahab, uh, d don't, don't do anything. Uh, just sit and wait, and God will take care of these countries that are coming to war against you, right? None of this makes sense. The, the, uh, the way we think and the way the world thinks, nothing God asks Israel to do to be saved ever makes sense. And what a surprise if the things the prophets are asking us to do don't match up with what the world is telling us is make what makes sense or what we should do. It, we shouldn't expect that it will. We just trust that God knows what he's doing and his prophets reveal that to us and we move forward. And even when it doesn't make sense or when it's counter to what the world is teaching us, because frankly, the world can't save us. So sticking with them is a bad idea. We got to go with the crazy. Um, that's uh, that's so uh, such a good summation. Even as we talk, too, about prophets uh, and being uh, sort of a mouthpiece for God or God can work through them to bless us, isn't it interesting in these examples with Moses that Moses still has plenty of weaknesses? Yeah. Uh, and, and, and sometimes today with the information age, uh, a, a prophet spits on the sidewalk or makes a, makes a statement that, that he later changes or something like this, and 
and our and our culture just jumps all over it. And how can you believe something like that? That that person's being led by God. Uh, and and I and I suspect that some of the ancient Israelites said, "Well, yeah, Moses, we remembered when you you know kind of uh, didn't follow the Lord's instructions at Meribah uh, and 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 other things." Um, yeah, so it's 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 such a fascinating thing to think of the Lord using prophets to to help us, but they're also uh, they're not translated beings or anything. They're just people like you and I are that that God has asked to to lead uh, His people. Anyway, uh, so there's another aspect here that I think we ought to to mention because this is one that the Book of Mormon just jumps all over. Uh, and it and it really captures Nephi's atten- attention, and then the other prophets also are quick to mention it. So, if you want to do a Book of Mormon study on uh, Numbers twenty-one uh, verses four through nine, you'd want. Let me just cite them for you. If if the listeners want to go back and look at these passages, I think I have them pretty well committed to memory. Uh, you have First Nephi seventeen verse forty-one. Okay, and that's where it says the fiery flying serpents. So you have this image of them flying. Some speculate that it could have been a breed of snakes in the in ancient Arabia that were tree snakes that actually could could kind of jump from branch to branch. But I think it's like Carrie said that it's probably the the strike of a big snake coming out and then recoiling is what the what the flying notion was. Uh, but in First Nephi seventeen forty one, you'll note that the point that Nephi wants to emphasize is says uh, God prepared a way for them that they might be healed, and the labor which they had to perform was to look like Carrie said, and probably embedded in that is walking back too, getting yeah. in the vicinity of the pole, uh, and because of the simpleness of the way or the easiness of it, there were many who perished. So the Book of Mormon emphasizes this simple thing. That it, it was just such a straightforward thing that they were commanded to do. Uh, no anti-venom, no ice packs, no anything else. Okay, just just get back to the pole and to look, and look at it. Now, if you go to the next reference, Second uh, Nephi twenty-five, there in verse. Uh, oh, let's see. It's over in verse twenty. Uh, of Second Nephi 25. Now, my brethren, I have spoken plainly that you cannot err as the Lord God liveth that brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt and gave unto Moses power that he should heal the nations after they had been bitten by the poisonous serpents. Isn't that interesting? It just keys in on this poisonous serpents one. I mean, it, God gave Moses power to part the Red Sea and to strike the rock and everything else. But the brazen serpent is a really dominant Old Testament uh, kind of just uh, transplant here. So anyway, he says, if they would cast their eyes upon uh, unto the serpent, which he did raise up before them, and also gave him power that he could smite the rock. Uh, 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 and, and it says, right, there none other name given under. So it's a direct reference there to Jesus Christ. Okay, so once again, uh, if they would just cast their eyes. Okay, go to the next one. I'll just fly quickly. I don't want to bore you too much. But the next one is Alma as he speaks about it uh, with the Zoramites. And he says in er, verse 30, uh, chapter 33, so it's Alma 33, and it's about verse 23. Let's see if I can go there real quickly. Uh, and uh, and in this one, he starts out, uh, <clears throat> he's talking about the plan of justice, faith under repentance, and verse 16, and then he goes to 17. Uh, God grant unto you that you may begin to exercise your faith under repentance. Okay. Uh Oh, I'm sorry. I was in 34. (laughs) Uh, Flip the page, Brother Wilson. All right. So it's in verse 19. uh, And he's been talking about because of the son, because of the son. And in verse 19 of chapter 33, he says, Behold, he was spoken of by Moses, referring to Jesus Christ. Uh, Yea, and a type was raised up in the wilderness. And whoso would look upon it might live. And many did look and live. But few understood the meaning of those things because of the hardness of their hearts. Okay, Uh, and then he goes on and they would not look. Therefore, they perished. Uh, Now is the reason they would not look is because they did not believe that it would heal them. Oh, my brethren, if you could be healed by merely casting about your eyes that ye might be healed, would ye not behold quickly or would ye rather harden your hearts in unbelief and be slothful that you would cast about your eyes that ye might perish? And then in verse 22, the capstone, if so, woe shall come upon you. But if not so, then cast about your eyes and begin to believe in the Son of God. 
that he will redeem this people. Okay, now, so that's the, the third reference. The fourth one is a more discreet one, but it does, does put this in a little kind of real pithy saying. In 37 verse 47, Alma says, referring just obliquely to this, look to God and live. Mm. And then you've got your last one in Helaman 8, which is largely he's reciting the prophets and saying, didn't prophet, didn't Moses testify of Christ, even as he raised up the serpent on the pole? Uh, so the Book of Mormon just really wants you to, to internalize this, uh, this Numbers 21 account. Gary? Oh, yeah. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean no, to I, interrupt. I, I, yeah, I just needed to come up for air, and I thought you might. Okay, yeah. Uh, well, actually, I did something. have something I want to say um, uh, in terms of the uh, uh, the easiness of the way that it, it talks about or that they don't believe. Uh, because sometimes the gospel answers are so easy that we feel like it, it has to be more than that. And we have a hard time believing it, that it can really do it. So I'm, I'm thinking of two things in particular. One, uh, the Book of Mormon. I, I remember this promise that President Benson gave us. Actually, he was repeating President Romney, but uh, the idea that if you will read the Book of Mormon daily as a family, and he has this whole list of things that will happen. You'll have more peace. You know, there'll be greater love and harmony in your home and all of these things, right? Uh, and it's almost too easy. Like, oh. And I, I fully believe, and I try to commit my family members, people in my ward and so on to say, whenever you're having a hard time, whenever you're having struggles, you need to commit that right when it's worst and you feel like not going to the scriptures, that's when you need to double down and read the Book of Mormon even more. But it just seems like it's too easy. Oh, the, the answer can't be just spending more time okay. in reading the Book of Mormon. But it is. <laughs> I mean, uh, but yeah, partially. I oh. I've read that book before. Yeah, 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 that's exactly right. I've read it. I've, uh, how is this going to do it? Now, part of the reason that the answer is in the Book of Mormon is because of the second thing that this is saying. It's not just because of the easiness of the way, but it's because they don't believe that it will heal them. And specifically, that's compared to believing in Christ, right? And that's what the Book of Mormon will do. will testify that Christ does redeem. And I think we struggle with that today. We have a hard time believing. We, we believe, oh, he'll probably save Keith Wilson because Keith is such a good guy. And I'll probably save this lady who always is taking bread to everyone or whatever else, right? But I don't know that he can save me. But the truth of the matter is that Christ can save you. It's that easy. It's that simple and it's that plain. You believe in Christ. You have true faith in Christ and he will save you. And uh, and and it doesn't matter how ding-dongy you are. It doesn't matter what's wrong with uh, you in doing this or what's wrong with you in doing that. Uh, you're not going to overpower the atonement. Christ can save you. But we struggle in believing that and believing it's that easy. And again, the book, part of the reason the Book of Mormon is so powerful is because it keeps turning us to Christ on every page. It turns us to Christ again and again and again. Um, if we would just believe that, there are so many sorrows and heartaches that we're going through that uh, some of them would just be taken away and some of them would be made less if we just really believe, even in the midst of, so let's let's say, for example, depression. I have uh, very uh, several people who are very, very close to me that really struggle with depression. And I'm not so naive to think that reading the Book of Mormon uh, every day for a month is just going to solve depression. And I'm not going to believe that that believing that, uh, well, I'm not going to say that if you really have faith in Christ, you won't have depression. I don't think that's accurate. I don't think that's the case. But I do think you can have hope that you'll get through this, that this will end, that God will heal you eventually. And knowing that can give you hope through the painful time. It goes back to this painful walk, right? You might have a long walk uh, uh, with a poisonous leg uh, of depression, but you can make that walk if you believe that at the end, Christ is going to save you. And that's really powerful, I think. Yeah, that's uh, that's so well uh, well said, Carrie. That, uh, uh, I, I love the fact that that your comment in there too about nothing is greater than the power of the atonement, uh, uh, and and yet sometimes we get immersed in in the snake bites of life, and we just it's hard to hard to have the the faith to just look. Now, uh, if I were to summarize this example in the Old Testament, uh, some of the things uh, that I'd want us to draw from would be uh, number one, uh, the fact that in life. Uh, it will be discouraging and will and will murmur in all likelihood. Number two, uh, turning to the Lord, He will call up people, prophets, uh, uh, and particularly the greatest of the prophets to provide and, and to help us as we go along the way. 
uh, like you said, not always to remove the obstacles, but but to help us in the path and to have hope, particularly. But then the 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 high point of the brazen serpent has to be the image of Christ and Christ in our lives and and looking at that. And then the last would be uh, Christ doesn't take all the problems away, but there is a simple solution to maintain hope, and that is to look to Christ and His great power. Now, let me just uh, cite for you if we're if we're if we're lining those up. Let me just cite for you one that I think is the epicenter, and that is looking to Christ, looking to Him uh, to to be the the source of power and hope and strength in our lives. And there's one classic example in the New Testament that I just have to tie into our discussion today, and, and I'll be brief. And that's Peter walking on the water, okay, mm. in between the feeding the 5,000 and the bread of life discourse. Uh, we have that evening where the Savior sends them on a boat. They get caught in a real bad storm out there on the Sea of Galilee. Uh, and in the midst of the storm, after praying on his own up in a mountain, uh, Jesus comes to him and walks on the water. And, uh, and, and it's a classic one. Everybody knows that example because it's such a, such a unique miracle of him defying gravity. When they see him, they cry out for fear. The disciples actually probably believe that he's the spirit of death because they've been struggling with this storm at least five or six hours in a small boat caught in the middle of a very deep and cold lake at night when the wind's blowing and splashing them with water, hypothermia, all that stuff. Uh, and, but they see Jesus and they first think he's probably the spirit of death. But then he speaks. And here's the cool thing. His voice, Peter hearing his voice, it just brings faith. And Peter just says, since you've come, can I just walk to you? I just want to hug you and thank you for coming in our hour of need. And the Savior says, sure, come, Peter. Uh, and Peter doesn't think a thing about it. He defies his physical body, defies gravity. And he walks on the water uh, to the Savior until something happens. Okay, so he has great faith to walk on the water and defy gravity and, uh, and without thinking. And then what happens? It says, when he saw the wind boisterous, there it's, it's Matthew chapter 14. It's about verse, uh, what it'll be? It'll be about verse 22, right in there. When he saw the wind boisterous, you don't see wind. So what's happened with Peter and his whole orientation? Yeah, he's been he's hit probably wave, by a right? big wave yeah. because the waves don't stop, even though he has power to overcome gravity. He's been hit by a big wave and it probably unsettled him a little bit. And he looks down because that, that would be seeing the wind boisterous, what the wind is doing. It's causing waves. He looks down at the waves and he begins to sink. And then Jesus, Jesus Peter cries out, Lord, save me. You know, Jesus reaches out and saves him and said, oh, thou of little faith. No less than two or three seconds before that, Peter had great faith. Yeah. He he was focused on the Lord. The Lord was there to save him. He wanted to thank him. He had great faith. And then what happened? He took his eyes off the Savior. Yeah. And uh, in, in changing his focus and his orientation, he lost faith. Here's a great little ditty that I put there, and it, and it equally applies to the brazen serpent. Faith follows focus. If you and I can do those little things that keep our mind and hearts kind of oriented towards the Savior, keep him in our mind, say our prayers, uh, read scriptures, keep influencing us in a fallen world, which kind of takes away from those things. If we can do that, then we'll have great faith and great power to meet the challenges. OK, uh, Peter's walking on the water didn't still the storm, but it, but it gave him the power Okay, uh, to walk on the water. Uh, and then the Savior says, wherefore didst thou doubt? It's because Peter took, he changed his focus. Yeah. And that's exactly the brazen serpent one. I just love those two in combination. Uh, Matthew 14 with with Numbers 21. Well, Kerry. And it's, it's those easy things, right, that we were talking about, the easiness of the way. But it is those easy things that help you maintain your focus on the Savior. That's why we keep emphasizing them. Keep doing those easy things to keep that focus on the Savior so you can have the faith to be healed of everything, right? That's good yeah. stuff. Maybe I'll throw in one other little thing if it's all right, just because uh, I, I I don't know why I didn't think of this earlier, but we have this funny little theme that's accidentally developed on this podcast uh, about uh, communing with God while you commute to be with God. So on your commute to be with God, you need to commune with God. And I'm thinking about uh, 
walking from wherever you were bitten to where the pole is. Uh, and that's where you're going to commune with God. Or if you're Peter, you're walking on the water to be with Christ, right? You're on the commute to be with God. Um, but you have to have that faith that it's worth it and that you can be saved. So you have to have that communion with God uh, as you're commuting in order to end up being saved. So it's just a, a little theme that's I've ex- once we brought it up, I've it's ended up being in almost every episode because it's it really is an important theme that we, we're we're on this journey and we need the communion to be saved. So anyway, uh, you were going to wrap us up a little. Yeah, Carrie, I was just wanting to to kind of end by saying some here that view this podcast might think, well, Brother Wilson, uh, Brother Muelstein, uh, they've been studying the scriptures all their life, and so uh, they, of course, they they get things out of them, uh, and and I just read them and I don't feel too much. I want to tell you that there's power in the scriptures. Yes. The reason why they've connected with me is over the years, I've kind of committed myself to to taking the scriptures more seriously. Now, I've been a teacher of the scriptures, and so it's been mandated in that sense. I have to stay ahead of my my teaching audience and things like that. I've got to stay in the scriptures. But that doesn't that doesn't make me a scripture scholar uh, or, or a scripture believer, I guess, is the better thing. The thing that brings me deep belief okay and 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 testimony of the scriptures is reading the scriptures and yes. seeing how they again and again how they inform my life and I just can bear testimony that when I focus my life on the Savior, not all problems go away I've got a bunch of them even today in my own life but it, I, I find that I, I can go forward and that I can I can live a, a fulfilling life I can thrive. Uh, because the scriptures bless me with his spirit and with direction and particularly focus on the Savior, uh, that uh, that our listeners might be recommitted to, to continue to place faith in the fact that when you look to him, uh, there is life. And as he said, there's an abundance of life, not just living, but there's an abundance of life. And I, I, I testify of that from my own experience as a young missionary who's discouraged, uh, as a teacher of the scriptures, as a father, and as a patriarch, it it just is truth that the scriptures will bless our lives. I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And thank you. Uh, thank you to our audience. Thank you to those who helped produce this. And thank you, Keith. But most of all, thanks to the Lord. You're certainly welcome.